let's talk about the relationship between control risk and detection risk, because this is actually something that uh, will come up time and time again, how they are inversely related, meaning the more work you do for detection risk, the more tests of details you do, the less you have to worry about control risk. And the lower the control risk, the higher the detection risk can be. Again, the auditor uses tests of controls to gauge this as accurately as possible. The more that the auditor tests the client's internal controls, the better idea the auditor has of the level of control risk. So you see, you're not lowering it by doing more testing. You're just discovering it. You're uncovering what the real control risk is. The true purpose of assessing control risk to validate the auditor's assessment of the risk that material misstatements may exist in the financial statements. When control risk is assessed at the maximum level, the assessment should be documented. Now, coming to detection risk, detection risk is directly affected by the auditor's assessment of control risk. So that's why we had step one, step two, step three, if we go back here. First, we assess inherent risk because we can't do anything about it. Then we assess control risk. And because of what we assess for control risk, that's going to affect what we get for detection risk. So we see there step one, step two, step three. And it's funny, I, I really, like I said, I was going to plan on going to this chart much more in detail when we see it again. But hey, I don't want to leave anything hanging. So really just dove into it there. Coming back here, the auditor uses tests of details, also known as substantive testing, totally interchangeable there, to reduce the overall audit risk. If both or either inherent or control risk are high, more tests of details need to be performed. Again, to balance out those theoretical numbers, those conceptual ideas there. If both or either inherent or control risk are low, less tests of details need to be performed. So if we already have low risk with our risk of material misstatement, right? Seeing there, these two risks together, then we can do less testing, which saves us money, saves us time. Those are real factors when we're auditing, right? We're real people. This isn't just some theoretical concept here. This is real people, boots on the ground, trying to conduct this work and time is money and money is money. Regardless of the assessed level of control risk, at least some substantive procedures will be performed for significant accounts, right? What I said before, assigning zero to either of those, that's conceptual. That's not in reality. In reality, you're definitely gonna do something, right? I mean, it's just, you're being hired to do something, so you're gonna do something. Um, but yeah, we're gonna do at least some procedures, but conceptually, theoretically, if any of those were zero, we'd be fine. Like I said, in a perfect world, the auditor would perform so many tests of details that detection risk essentially hits zero, thus bringing overall audit risk to zero, as mentioned. However, in the real world, auditors have time and budget constraints, so this is not practical. Okay. Unfortunately, in the real world, it's not magic. We don't have all the time in the world, all the money in the world. Some more information on this risk of material misstatement. Inherent risk and control risk exist independently from the audit, meaning you're not going to affect them. You're just going to uncover them, uncover what the real risk is. The only risk that the auditor can have an impact on and decrease is detection risk by performing more substantive procedures, again, also known as test of details. Yes, the auditor can perform test controls in relation to control risk. However, these simply give the auditor more security over the internal controls rather than reducing the actual risk. I'm repeating this over and over, different ways of saying it. All of this comes from multiple choice questions. All of this comes from items that you're going to see on the exam. I want to make sure you really have this down. All three risk types can be assessed using non-quantitative means. So we, we did use quantitative means, which was the numbers. However, we can say using non-quantitative, such as high, medium, and low. In reality, in an audit planning team, you may just say high, medium, low. Probably won't use those numbers, although maybe you do. I'm not really sure how each audit team does. I haven't polled every audit team in the entire country. I will get to that at some point, though. If the preliminary assessment of the risk of material misstatement is too low as compared to the risk discovered after audit procedures, the auditor can work to decrease detection risk in order to lower the overall audit risk. An original assessment of the risk of material misstatement that is too low can arise from many situations, such as control risk being too low from internal controls, appearing to be more properly implemented than they are. So you can adjust this as needed throughout the audit. That's essentially what we're saying here. We can adjust these numbers as we discover more items. You know, yeah, you're just gonna do more work, right? Every day you do more work, every week you do more work, depending on how long the audit is, and you're not stuck in your ways. You're not locked into these pre-assessments of these risks. You're gonna adjust it. That just makes sense, and that's what we should do.
Lastly, as the acceptable level of detection risk increases, the level of assurance needed from substantive testing decreases, and as such, the auditor may reduce the sample size. Again, coming from direct different questions, making sure you're familiar with these phrases, making sure you understand them, as the acceptable level of detection risk increases, meaning the acceptable level, meaning you can have a lower, you can have a higher detection risk and a lower amount of testing. The level of assurance needed from testing decreases, so you can reduce the sample size, which means you're doing less work, which means you're doing less testing. Less work is good. <laughs> Let's work hard to make sure that we can do less work. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material. We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.